Welcome to Weather Extra. I'm meteorologist Jillian Grace. We've seen that summer heat return to Central Texas over the weekend. Hopefully you've been finding ways to keep cool. Record heat and persistent drought have been the main stories for Canada, which has led to widespread fires across the second largest country in the world. We get Weather Extra started today by taking a deeper dive into those devastating wildfires and learn more on why smoke from those fires inundated the United States. Canada has had an unusually intense wildfire season this year, stretching coast to coast across the entire country. This week alone, there have been over 400 active fires at a single time, with more than half of those considered out of control by local authorities battling those blazes. Canada's government stated that they're expecting higher than normal fire activity to continue throughout the fire season, which lasts through September because of the combination of the ongoing drought and record heat. In fact, this past May was one of the warmest and driest on record according to local officials. So far this year, over 2,000 fires have been reported, which have already charred over 10 million acres, larger than the state of Connecticut and 15 times the annual average of the past decade. Six and a half million of those acres were burned in the month of May alone. Canadian government officials describe this wildfire season as devastating, stating that this could become the worst wildfire season the country has ever seen. These fires forced over 100,000 Canadians to evacuate and displaced over 20,000 from their homes. And here in the United States, smoke from those wildfires traveled south, creating apocalyptic scenes and unhealthy air quality for more than 100 million Americans across at least 15 states, from the Northeast in places like New York and Vermont, down south into the Carolinas, and in the Midwest in Ohio and Kansas. New York City's air quality levels reached the worst in recorded history Wednesday afternoon when the air quality index hit 405, which smashed the previous record of 279 back in July of 1981. And at one point last week, New York City had the worst air quality in the world, beating out major cities like Delhi, India and Beijing, China. The Canadian wildfire smoke left many cities across the eastern U.S. with smoke-filled skies and created unbelievable scenes that you typically only see in movies. An orange and red sky took over the Big Apple, which is what you see on your screen right now. Visibility managed to drop to half a mile as skyscrapers across Manhattan became engulfed in the dense smoke. Residents across New York City said the smell from the smoke was so strong, similar to sitting around a campfire. Major League Baseball games were postponed across the Northeast. Schools and businesses were closed, and the thick smoke even caused travel issues at some of the nation's busiest airports, causing all planes to be grounded at one point. Days of that thick smoke choked many cities across the eastern U.S., and you may be wondering how it got there in the first place. Well, here to explain more on the weather pattern that set this up, we bring in meteorologist Sean Bellafuri. Sean. We're taking a look at visible satellite on Saturday, June 3rd, and you can clearly see these wildfires really billowing smoke up into the atmosphere. These fires have been ongoing for quite some time, but it's a change to the upper level weather pattern that caused the smoke to move into the United States. Water vapor imagery is one of the best tools that we have to kind of show you what the airflow is doing across the country. And I want you to take a look for those areas of spin, the highs and the lows across the country. Now we will show you exactly where those highs and lows were, but uh, if you have a little bit of meteorological uh, know-how, you can see that not only do we have an area of low pressure that's spinning its way off of the Atlantic coast, but we also have a ridge of high pressure too. The ridge of high pressure has clockwise flow around it, so that would take any sort of smoke in Canada and shove it southward, but the area of low pressure also does the same thing. Counterclockwise flow pulls that smoke into the country. The reason why, though, it's been around for a couple of days is because of a blocking pattern. This ridge of high pressure is in the perfect spot to create what is called an omega block. It's a weather pattern that looks like the Greek letter omega. High pressure blocks lows on either side from moving too far too fast. And for the majority of the past week, this area of low pressure has just been meandering across the northeast. Now, watch what happens as that area of low pressure finally takes hold of all of the smoke kind of lingering across Canada on June 4th, but then with showers and thunderstorms firing up on June 5th and the upper level winds shifting to come more out of the north, that just caught onto that smoke plume and pulled it southward. 
What's going to be happening this week with the virus? Well, thankfully, better conditions across the country. The area of low pressure that is going to dominate the smokiness and the smoke pattern from these fires in Canada is going to be off to the west. That means southerly winds aloft, which should push a lot of the wildfire smoke away from the country. Now, yes, some wildfire smoke could kind of rotate in on the backside of that area of low pressure, but the good news for the megapolis across the east coast, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Philadelphia, New York and Boston is that as we move deeper into the week, we are expecting westerly winds aloft, which should take any lingering wildfire smoke, push it out to sea. And also that area of low pressure is going to be directly over those fires. So hopefully some much needed rain will help to douse them out. Reporting in the studio, Sean Bellafuri, KWTX News 10. And as those wildfires burn across Canada, there are provinces and territories that are facing challenges getting the help they need to keep communities safe and fight encroaching wildfires. As we hear from Cameron McIntosh, it's been an exceptionally busy time for the group heading efforts to share resources from coast to coast. Coast to coast, front lines keep flaring up and wildfires keep draining local firefighting capacity. This is uh, the CIFC's coordination center. Here, it's all being tracked in real time. What do we have up on the board here? So it basically gives you an overview of the national wildfire, wildland fire situation. Precipitation, hotspots, forecasts, and critically, available firefighting resources. The fire center and duty officer speaking. So when a province or territory needs outside help, this is who they call. We take that request and we go out to the other provinces and territories looking for who may have a surplus. The Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre is a partnership between the provinces, territories and federal government. It doesn't assign resources, but constantly evaluates who could help and who can't. Let's say Alberta right now is really busy, so that's probably not the province that you would go and ask for, uh, for resources. And I imagine that that's constantly evolving. That's evolving, exactly. So yes. the water bomber that might have been available yesterday might not be available today. That's a possibility. Canada's on fire. Wildfire expert Mike Flanagan says with so much risk, fire authorities face tough decisions. Do I keep some of my crews at home? Because, hey, maybe right now it's okay in my home province, but next week it's looking hot dry and windy. That's partly why international help is coming in. These South Africans heading to Alberta, while Costa Rican and American crews are going to Nova Scotia. But that takes days. Fires can move by the minute. Frustrating for a premier like Tim Houston. The urgency of the need should be obvious. People's homes are literally burning down. Their lives are being turned upside down. In some places, the military is also being deployed. With so much of the country so dry, there's no telling how long this goes. That's why we have all these tools. Watching for that single lightning strike or shift in the wind, that can change everything. And in other top weather stories from the past week, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said on Thursday that El Nino has officially arrived. El Nino is a natural phenomenon in the tropical Pacific Ocean. It typically brings warmer than average temperatures and could increase the risks of heavy rainfall and droughts in certain places. NOAA officially say that this year uh, El Nino is expected to increase global temperatures and could push 2023 or 2024 to be the warmest year on record. El Nino's influence of the U.S. is forecast to be weak during the summer, but stronger starting in the fall. According to NOAA, that could mean wetter than average conditions from Southern California to along the Gulf Coast. And a new study shows sea ice could temporarily disappear from the Arctic about a decade earlier than predicted. The researchers say a total melt is possible in the 2030s during the month of September when levels tend to be lowest. They blame human caused pollution, but say reducing it would still result in an ice free Arctic by the 2050s. That's a more dire prognosis than the UN forecast from 2021. The study is out Tuesday in the journal Nature Communications. The research analyzed satellite data and climate models over a 40 year period. Whether extra We'll be right back. Welcome back to Weather Extra. The official start to summer is just 10 days away, kicking off Wednesday, June 21st. We started to feel that summer heat this weekend, and it's looking to hang around for a while, too. Thankfully, though, throughout the springtime months, we've been blessed with what we need, which is rain, and it's helped our current drought situation across central Texas. For more in-depth look at the drought monitor and where we stand now, here's Chief Meteorologist Brady Taylor. Yeah, Jillian, we have seen a dramatic improvement in the drought conditions across central Texas compared to when it was really bad midsummer last year. This is the drought monitor 
August 21st of last year, and this is when it really was at its worst, exceptional drought covering a large portion of Central Texas and pretty much the entire Central Texas area under extreme or exceptional drought. Fast forward to this week. This was Thursday's drought monitor that was released. Areas along and east of I-35, no drought concerns. And as you go west, yes, we still have some concerns, but again, nothing as bad as last year. We've got some uh, moderate drought concerns and at times some severe drought concerns across Coriel parts of Hamilton County. Here's the reason why just a big improvement in rain where we are now compared to this time last year. At this point last year, we had less than nine inches of rain compared to this year. We're over 15 inches. The crazy thing is we're still actually below normal on rain by a little bit. Normally at this time of year, we should already have 17 inches. This has made an improvement in our lake levels, but we're still sitting well below normal. Lake Waco in the last three months has come up nearly four feet. Lake Whitney is up over a foot compared to where it was. And overall by percentage full, Lake Whitney is in the best shape of all of our area lakes. Now across Bell County, not as much improvement. Uh, Lake Belton is up uh, eight tenths of a foot. Now Stillhouse is actually down over the last three months, nearly a foot lower. And both of our lakes in Bell County are 60 to 70 percent full. So we need a lot more rain. Now the problem is, is we're heading into the hotter summertime months. And for a look at what we expect as we head into the summer, check in with meteorologist CD Finley. That is right. We are starting to get to the part of the part of the summer where we are beginning to warm up. As you look at our six to ten day temperature outlook, we're expecting some above normal temperatures for this time of year. And even looking into the broader look, it's pretty much the case off of for most of central Texas and even part, part, portions of uh, southern Texas. And as we kind of take a broader look at the summer months, July, August and September, we're kind of expecting the same thing to happen. We're expecting more above normal temperatures for pretty much the entire summer. So it will definitely be a little bit more toasty than usual. Now, according to our summer stats, these are kind of some things to keep in mind as we head into summer. We usually average about 2400 degree, degree days per summer and then we had 6800 degree days last year. So again, even last year was a little bit more warmer than normal. And our hot, hottest day last year, which was July 10th, top, capped off at 109 degrees. And we usually average our first 100 degree day by, by July 4th. So we are starting as the further we get into June, the more likely we'll be, we will be to see our first 100 degree day this year. All right, coming up after the break, we take a look at this week's Degrees of Science with meteorologist Camille Hawksworth, who has more on how you can get yourself and your family prepared for hurricane season. We'll be right back. Being ready for tropical systems can make a huge difference and ultimately it can save lives. We're talking today with safety expert and CEO of Dry Sea, Brad Greer. You've lived this firsthand, so you know how important it is to stay safe and be prepared. And so when you are preparing for hurricane season, what are some of the things that we could do right now if you live along the coast to be prepared? Right, uh, always consider a uh, generator. Uh, obviously, if your house floods, you're going to be without electricity, power, and gas for uh, any number of days. So if you uh, <clears throat> can get your hands on a generator, uh, that would be very, very smart. And prepare your uh, house uh, for any flood or hurricane situation by, uh, one, having uh, uh, flood insurance. We need to remember that our homeowners insurance policies do not cover uh, flood damage. So that's very, very important. It's also important to have a first aid kit uh, in your home. And if you have uh, um, a home with more than one level, have a first aid kit, at least one on each level. The CDC uh, states that 48% of Americans do not have a first aid kit or emergency kit at all in their home and by the way that number is higher in your automobile if there's uh, uh, rough weather dangerous weather uh, hurricanes a uh, hurricane that's coming your way have a uh, first aid kit in your automobile each automobile and have it where it's reachable do not have it in your trunk uh, so if you do have to evacuate uh, with loved ones kids pets make sure again you have that first aid kit in your automobile Brad, what's in your first aid kit? You showed us the first aid kit. What are some of the important things in there? Yeah, well, bandages, dressings, um, 
antiseptics, alcohol wipes, uh, gauze, uh, <clears throat> uh, tweezers, again, the waiters that we talked about, uh, aspirin, uh, any item that, uh, that would uh, help you uh, uh, care for a wound while you wait for emergency personnel. And these emergency first aid kits can be found at local retailers and, of course, Amazon as well. Yeah. Items too, uh, Camille, that sometimes folks don't think about, uh, which are, you know, have fire extinguishers on hand. Uh, if there's flood water, that could cause an electrical fire in your home. Uh, in addition to that, um, also have uh, headlamps, uh, flashlights, make sure those batteries are charged up. If the uh, power goes out at night, you'll need to be see, uh, be able to see uh, to safely move around, gather items, gather loved ones in a, in a safe fashion. I feel like you've given us some really easy, tangible things to go ahead and, and collect. Like you mentioned, the, the prepackaged first aid kits, but also some of those additional things that we need to gather and get ready for that. Absolutely. And Brad, you mentioned some, some great things already, um, but we know that hurricanes are not only a coastal problem. They don't just affect those along the coast. They also can cause damage hundreds of miles away from the storm. You know, excessive rainfall, damaging winds, high water, and, and even tornadoes can all happen far inland. How can we better assess our risk and prepare for that if we're not exactly on the coastline? Yes, of course, be prepared. Um, you know, going back in history, uh, as we know, Hurricane Harvey made landfall in uh, Rockport. So if it would have continued on that track, it would have uh, headed towards San Antonio, maybe Austin, but the Hill Country. And remember, uh, in the Hill Country, uh, there's limestone and rock. So the water, uh, it takes time for it to absorb in the ground. So if Harvey would have hit San Antonio, it would have been a, 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 a cataclysmic flood problem for San Antonio and the Hill Country. Uh, flash floods would have filled creeks and rivers uh, almost instantaneously and be prepared for that and then travel to safe ground. Uh, Harvey dumped 1.2 trillion gallons of water uh, in Southeast Texas and that's a lot of water. So we need to be prepared that uh, uh, things could get very bad very quickly. Absolutely. And, you know, are there things that we can do that maybe we're not evacuees ourselves, but we can, there are people that are displaced from their homes, maybe we're a little bit farther inland. Are there things that we can do to prepare for those people that may be coming to our cities that need help? Absolutely. And we learned this ourselves. Uh, uh, we had family and friends that traveled uh, from as far away as Austin to help us after Harvey to gather items, uh, keep loved ones safe. So have a plan there. Uh, if, if you live in Central Texas or Waco and you've got friends or family in Fort Worth or another place not in the line of a, a particular storm, um, have a plan and, and have those folks uh, ready to come render aid and, and help and assist uh, you and your loved ones in the path of the storm in the event that it happens. To catch this full interview, go to kwtx.com slash degrees of science or scan the QR code on your screen and it will take you to our YouTube page. Welcome back to Weather Extra. If you've been driving around across Central Texas, you may have seen the beautiful patches of sunflowers and maybe even stopped to take some pictures. Julie Hayes joins us now with more on where you can find one patch in McLennan County that's catching the attention of many. Well, if you've driven down Highway 84 from Waco toward McGregor, you cannot miss them. Everyone and their dog literally are stopping to get a picture like this pup, Sheila. She stopped with her owner to strike a pose and Sheila is far from alone. People from all over the area are coming to the patch to get a picture. A family from Crawford is harvesting the sunflowers in three different patches, but the most visible are the seven feet tall sea of sunflowers off of Highway 84 right next to Harris Creek Baptist Church. There's about 180 acres of flowers there. I talked with Westerfield Farms, who is leasing the land and planted the sunflowers back in March. 
It's the first time they've done it. Usually they plant wheat as a rotation for corn, but the late freezes can be tough on the crops, so they're trying out sunflowers this round. When I stopped by today, I found one man who had pulled over to get some photos. The view in here is so beautiful. All the uh, sunflowers, they're so beautiful, and they just catch your eyes every time you drive by. I'm working in the area, but every time I pass by, I just see the, the sunflowers and they're beautiful. So it's a good place to come and take a few pictures. In addition to the blanket of yellow off of Highway 84, there is also a patch on Spring Valley close to Chapel Road and a third one going to Mother Neff Park toward McGregor. A reminder, this is someone's livelihood. While you're welcome to stop and take a picture, they say please don't step on the sunflowers or pick them. And if you want to get a picture, you better hurry. The yellow of the flower will likely start falling off in the next few weeks. And really, they are gorgeous. Drive by and see them if you can. Reporting in the studio, I'm Julie Hayes. If you had plans to head out to look at some of those sunflowers or have any outdoor plans this week, make sure you're staying hydrated as a true taste of Texas summer hangs around. That's all we have for you for this week's episode of Weather Extra. We'll see you again next week.